this crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. This crusade, this war on terrorism, uh, is going to take a while. And the American people must be patient. You can see in the foreground the flags of the 117 member states which are flying. And now the car approaches the door. This surely is a moment which will live in the memory of those who witness it. Pope Paul VI, the spiritual leader of more than half a billion people all over the face of the earth, inheritor of a lineage of 2,000 years, is greeted in this house by the chief representative of a world organization made up of member nations who can count over two billion people of many kinds and many creeds, an organization which man brought into being 20 years ago. His Holiness descends, is greeted by the United Nations Chief of Protocol, who of course met him at Kennedy Airport this morning. The Secretary General awaits inside the threshold of the United Nations building. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Joggler66, Hour of the Truth, again today in collaboration with my brother in Christ Tom Fress from the Ministry Inquisition Update from the United States of America, who I will um, invite to say a few words uh, directly after telling you that this is the fifth reading now that we are going to do of this wonderful book from Steve Wahlberg and Time Delusions, the fifth reading of this and it is the 11th video in the whole playlist and it's going to be a long playlist, it's going to be many many parts, there's going to be a few repetitions here and there but you know as much as the lies being repeated in this world it cannot hurt a true Christian to repeat the truth once in a while. That's why here and there we tread on the same uh, the same place over and over again but that's only to make the point that you will really understand it because the whole world is being betrayed. When we come a little bit further in the book and we come to the subject of the Israel deception, you know, because this last section of the book, section 4, deals with the book that he published under the own title, the Exploding the Israel Deception, when it comes to that part, you will finally, hopefully, Tom and I pray and hope that you will understand then how deep the deception worldwide really goes. Everyone is accepting the nation-state of Israel. And the nation-state of Israel today, as much as we love the Jews that are in there, we want to provoke them to jealousy, as Paul asked us in Romans 11. We know that that state is a futurist state. It's just the fulfilling of the futurist agenda of the Jesuits and the Roman Catholic, not Christian, but anti-Christian, satanic church. And with these words, I very much welcome Brother Tom Fress to the broadcast. Hello, Tom, and welcome. How are you doing? Hello, Yerk, and uh, hello to your listeners. I'm very happy to be here. Please pardon my my uh, laryngitis, but uh, uh, what you said was very well spoken, and I agree with you wholeheartedly, and I'm anxious to continue our study. Then that's what we are going to do. 
we, last time we stopped on the top of page 22 in the PDF. The end time delusions we are reading in chapter 1. Now you see them, now you don't, dealing with the rapture. And we were just speaking about these uh, five points and uh, just starting these, um, uh, this, this chapter here. So now we go into the very first full paragraph on the next page, page 22, where it says, quote, These popular concepts, rapture, seven years of horror, future antichrist, have also been taught in many apocalyptic Christian films, such as A Thief in the Night, Image of the Beast, Tribulation Force, The Omega Code, Left Behind, the movie, and Megiddo. Ah, and there I made a little comment about that. And what is there to say about that? Now, this is going to be of importance later on, too, in the reading of this book. So here's the explanation of what Megiddo or Armageddon actually is. And this is taken from Britannica.com. Megiddo is a modern Tel Megiddo, important town of ancient Palestine, overlooking the plain of Estvelon, which is the valley of Jezreel. It lies about 18 miles, which is 29 kilometers, southeast of Haifa in northern Israel. Megiddo's strategic location at the crossing of two military and trade routes gave the city an importance far beyond its size. It controlled a commonly used pass on the trading route between Egypt and Mesopotamia, and it also stood along the northwest-southeast route that connected the Phoenician cities with Jerusalem and the Jordan River Valley. It is thought that the word Armageddon is derived from Megiddo, since the prefix me har means hill in Hebrew. Hence, Armageddon means hill of Megiddo. Because the rapture teaching has been promoted so heavily in our society, even among those outside the church, by movies, who even people visit and watch who have nothing to do with uh, religion very often, a rumor has circu circulated that some higher-ups at American Airlines want at least one non-Christian pilot aboard each flight, just in case. The real question is, although quote-unquote rapture isn't a biblical word, it's a Latin word by the way, is the doctrine in the Bible? Now if not, could it be an end-time delusion? Now this is what we are going to find out. First of all, the Bible certainly does teach the exciting truth that Jesus Christ will return for his people. Our Lord himself said in John chapter 14, verse 3, quote, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. All Christians should believe Christ's promise and long to meet him on that great day. But will he come invisibly? Will the church disappear? Does the Bible really teach vanishing Christians? Without a doubt, the most quoted passage used to support the rapture concept is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. We read in the King James Bible, quote, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Unquote. Lots of Christians know this verse by heart, and it is cited in Left Behind, the movie. There Paul wrote that true believers will someday be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. But does caught up mean disappear? Is Paul describing a silent return of Jesus Christ before an apocalyptic seven-year tribulation? We don't need to guess. The answer is in the context, and you don't need to have a four-year degree to grasp the truth. Have you ever driven down a highway without realizing how fast you were going, and then when you finally looked down at your speedometer, you thought to yourself, I'm going too fast, I must slow down. 
This is what we need to do with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We must slow down and take a full look. Here is what Paul actually wrote. And before I'm going to read this, I have another little remark that I want Tom to go into and explain, because Tom is the one who uttered that first when I listened to his readings of Exploding the Israel Deception reading at uh, the end of 2010, beginning of 2011, when he read that book on uh, Inquisition Updates uh, program at the time on First Amendment Radio. Tom said something so profound, and that goes for all readings we do in this book. Every time when we are going to read a, a book about biblical truths, like in this case, End Time Delusions, or any other book, but especially this book, where we are going to smash, where really smash, the false teaching of the Antichrist of futurism, you have to take off your church glasses. Tom, I really want to invite you to go a few minutes about and please tell the people that when they do not take off the church's glasses during these readings, they still will not get it. Please elaborate on that as you did in your wonderful book reading at the time a few years ago. Yes, well, the listeners need to realize, as this author has realized and has said, the word rapture doesn't exist in the Bible. The concept doesn't is not taught either. We are taught about the resurrection. That is an issue that even Jesus addressed uh, to the so-called Sadduce Sadducees uh, when he was on earth. And uh, there is indeed a resurrection where the righteous will be raised from the dead, and then we which are alive and remain shall caught up, be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then another place refers to this, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, ascension uh, as having taken place during the last trump, okay? For the trumpet shall sound, okay? The dead in Christ shall rise first. All right, that's the last trump. Let me ask the listeners an obvious question. How many last trumps are there? Is God not able to count? The last trump is the last trump. There's not a, there's not a, a, a trumpet afterwards. Okay, so this takes place at the last trump. Okay, first, and another thing, and it depend, and it's, goes back to the point we made in the, in the broadcast last time. It's essential that you have in your hands the real Word of God. Okay? We advocate the King James Bible, this the authorized King James Bible, and none of these so-called modern Bibles. They are all perverted in order to drive this futurist agenda. They've changed the language. They've changed the, the tense. And they, they've done every subtle thing in order to drive and to perpetuate this delusion, this grand delusion called futurism. Okay? The Bible tells us, uh, let's just remind the listeners that Paul was dealing with a controversy among the church uh, members about, about when Christ was going to come. And some even had suggested that Christ had already come. He had come in the, in, in, uh, the spirit, and uh, that somehow uh, uh, God's people had missed it, and they were all concerned about it. And Paul had to set the record straight. He said, before Christ can come, that man of sin must be revealed. Okay? He said, there will come first a falling away. All right? That means an apostasy. And you look up the, uh, the Greek translation of the word used there, and it, it is apostasy. And so we're talking about a falling away from the faith. And then that man of sin would be revealed. And all this happened to have to happen before Christ returns. Okay, this is, this is the, the, the very heart of the historicist interpretation of Bible prophecy. The correct interpretation of Bible prophecy is carefully examine what Paul said to the church. 
when they were worried that Christ had already come, they'd heard rumors that Christ had already come and that they'd missed this, the resurrection, Paul said, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Meaning the Caesars were going to be taken out of the way. It was the Caesars that were restraining the rise of the papacy. Okay? All right? And, and, and he said there had to become a great falling away first, and then that man of sin would be revealed. All right? The son of perdition, he calls him. And that's the papacy. He's speaking specifically about the papacy coming to rise after the Caesars were taking out, taken out of the way. Paul used the word now. He who now letteth will let, or he who now restrains will restrain until he's taken out of the way. All right? It, it's not a matter of controversy, not a legitimate controversy, to discover who Paul was talking about. There was only one power in charge. Daniel confer, or confirms this in his prophecy when he talked about the four Gentile kingdoms that would exist prior to Christ's return. Okay? The Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, succeeded by the Grecian, and then finally the fourth and final empire the Roman, okay? Now, we all know that Rome was in power even when Jesus was born. That fourth and final power was already in power when Jesus was born. And it was that fourth and final empire, the Caesars, who oversaw the crucifixion of Christ together with the Jews. And it, we have to know that that fourth and final power will still be in power at the time Jesus returns. Okay? That's the common sense out of this whole thing. It's so easy to, to rebut these futurist lies. And everybody talks about the fall of the Roman Empire. No, it didn't fall. It just morphed into the so-called Holy Roman Empire under the, sea, under the, the papal Caesar. And we have Pope, uh, uh, Pope uh, Pius IX in the 1870s claiming himself to be Caesar, which means king of kings. That was in the 1800s, the, the middle to late 1800s. Pope uh, Pius IX, in writing, in a public discourse, uh, hailed himself as Caesar. And we have uh, here, uh, Nicholas, or rather, uh, Yerk has found uh, the quote from uh, Pope Pius IX in his Discorsi, page 253, said, quote, The Caesar who now addresses you and to whom alone are obedience and fidelity due. Okay, Pope Pius IX was speaking of himself, and he referred to himself as Caesar. Okay, now that's in that that's in the context of the Pope's temporal power. Okay, that's his kingly status as King of Kings. Okay, the Pope has two crown, uh, two thrones: the spiritual power, and in this case, the temporal power. And uh, uh, under the spiritual power, he calls himself the Vicar of Christ. And under the temporal power, he calls himself Caesar, okay? The king of kings, and all the kings of the earth must obey him. And uh, that's to where all the kings of the earth, their obedience and fidelity is due to the popes, okay? That's the way it was before the Protestant Reformation, and, uh, and uh, it was the pope who pressured the kings of the earth to go about in, in their nations in, in, in their countries, and to purge out all the quote-unquote heretics. And anybody who said that the papacy was the Antichrist, and there were many, they, called the, they were called heretics by the, by the Roman Catholic Church, by the papacy, by the priests, by the bishops. And they pressured the governments of every land to pursue these people and to kill them, and to confiscate their property, to enrich both the kingdom and to enrich the papacy. So it became a lucrative business to go around in all the countries of Europe 
every all of quote unquote Christendom and rout out these so-called heretics, these Bible believing Christians that understood what Daniel was talking about, that being the papacy. They understood who Paul was talking about, that being the papacy. They understood who John was talking about in the book of Revelation, that being the papacy, the man of sin came after a great falling away in the church. Apostasy was rampant in the church. The church became worldly after it was made uh, uh, the religion of the Roman Empire under the, under the uh, under Constantine, where they legalized Christianity and made it the 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 uh, the, uh, the religion of the empire. And that's when the Roman Catholic Church became all powerful and all corrupt. All right. God's people never had anything whatsoever to do with the Roman Catholic Church. They did they they spoke against it as the synagogue of Satan and the, the, the Bishop of Rome was the man of sin. Can you imagine being in a house church during the first few centuries? of the Christian era and get word that the Bishop of Rome, the Pope of Rome has issued an edict throughout all of Christendom that from this day forward, only he could pick the bishops of the churches. Only he had the authority to pick the bishops. Now, what would you do if you were a bishop in one of the house churches that we read so much about in the new Testament, the church of Thessalonica, the church of Corinth, the Church of Jerusalem, the Church of Asia, the churches of Asia that John wrote about. What do you think those people thought to themselves? What do you think they said publicly when the word came down, the edict came down from Rome that only the Bishop of Rome was going to uh, pick the bishops? He was he called he asserted to himself the title Bishop of Bishops. I'll tell you what common sense dictate to you what. The Amer what the uh, the Bible believing Christians said, this is the man of sin, that Jesus prophesied, that John prophesied, that Paul prophesied, that Daniel prophesied. This is the man of sin, who calls himself the vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on earth, and asserts his power to pick all the bishops. Where heretofore, the bishops were chosen amongst the elders of every local congregation and under the leading and teaching of the Holy Spirit. Now that's all gone, and one man, the so-called self-styled vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on earth, now has asserted to himself power to pick all the bishops of all the churches in Christendom. If there was any doubt in anybody's mind what role at that time the papacy played, that doubt was gone. This is the man of sin. This is the son of perdition. This is the time of the great falling away. Now, what if the, the uh, deceiving pastors of the churches told us about this, what, this quote unquote great falling away, this great apostasy that took place that allowed for the rise of this man of sin in Rome? You know what they're telling us? You know what they've been telling us for? as far as I know, 50 years and probably all the way back to the early 1800s. They're telling us that this great falling away was not a falling away at all. It was a catching away, the great catching away. And this they used to support their idea of a secret rapture where before the man of sin is revealed, there'd be a great catching away, a great Exodus, out of, the, out of the graves and out of the flesh of every Bible-believing Christian before the man of sin is revealed. How convenient. And how sincerely it is believed by the vast majority of Christians today when it had never even been heard of prior to about 1820. 1820. If you were to tell anybody prior to that time about this so-called rapture that's so, so lovingly believed and looked for and hoped for among the Christians today, they'd look at you like you had three heads. They'd never heard of such a thing. 
and that they knew the Bible didn't preach of no such thing. Yes, the Bible talks about the resurrection. Matter of fact, there are two resurrections, one for the righteous and one for the wicked. Bible makes it clear, two resurrections. But the resurrection of the righteous takes place at the last trump. And again, I ask the obvious question, if there's a rapture, how many last trumps are there? There's only one last trump. And it's not the resurrection. It's the 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 uh, or it's not the rapture it's the resurrection okay there is no rapture taught in the bible there's only the great falling away that took place just prior to the rise of the papacy if it were not for that great falling away the papacy would have been unable to uh, gain sway in the world because of that great apostasy, Rome could then step forward and fill the power vacuum left behind by the Roman Caesars. That's exactly what history records. And you can trust your authorized King James Bible when it talks about the falling away first, and then that man of sin should be revealed. That's how Paul straightened out the wayward Christians who were told lies that Christ had already come and that they had missed his, the resurrection. Okay? It was a concern. Paul addressed it. Don't think that Christ is going to return immediately because the man of sin must first be revealed. And before that takes place, there's going to be a great falling away. Now, doesn't the truth make more sense than the nonsense that they've been teaching uh, for 50. Look, I can remember this. Uh, the author rightly mentions this movie uh, called, uh, uh, if I could, uh, uh, if, if he could put, uh, if uh, Yurt could put that back up. Left uh, Behind. The, uh, the Left Behind uh, the, no, uh, that's the modern one. The, the Thief in the Night is the one that they that that, that was so popular. Uh, the Thief in the Night, when, Image of the Beast, uh, Tribulation Force, yeah, the Omega Code yeah. Left Behind. So these are all movies of the same quote unquote series of this Left Behind series, and The Thief in the okay. Night is one of the first. Yeah, back in the early 1970s, the late 1960s. The most popular Christian movie at the time was entitled A Thief in the Night. As a matter of fact, it became so popular that the church leaders of the, of the town that I was growing up in and going to school in, the church leaders got together with the leaders of the schools and had the schools let out, the ch let out so that all the children could go to the theater and watch this movie, A Thief in the Night. And it's all about the rapture. It's all about the seven years of tribulation, which is never spoken of anywhere in the scriptures. I trust You can trust me when I tell you there is going to be great tribulation for God's people, but it's not going to be limited to no seven years. The seven years that they talk about for this so-called great tribulation comes directly from Daniel's prophecy, chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. It talks about 70 weeks. And, the, and what they're talking about is the last and final week of that prophecy, a seven-year period of time, which we know today, which should have been known in all the Christian world for, for ever since the apostolic age till today, that that represented Christ's ministry on the earth. Seven-year period of time. He was baptized. Three and a half years later, he was crucified. Three and a half years later, after the, the, the Jerusalem rejected the gospel, then the gospel went to the Gentiles. Seven years completed. Jesus perfectly and completely fulfilled that 70th and final week of Daniel 2,000 years ago, and you've been lied to by every person so-called Protestant pastor was nothing but a Jesuit in disguise standing behind the pulpits. You so love his big hair and his big vocabulary, but he's adopted Jesuit lies. 
and told you that the 70th week of Daniel is yet future, and it's going to be seven years of tribulation, and what's going to happen is if you're, you're all paid up with the pastor, you're going to be raptured out of here before the man of sin is revealed, and he's not going to be revealed until there's a new nation state of Israel, there's a new temple built so that the Jews can make animal sacrifices again and do what they tried to do 2,000 years ago after Jesus told them he was going to destroy that temple, not only his body, but that temple was going to be destroyed, not one stone upon the other. Why? Because God will no longer accept sacrifices of any kind. His son was the sacrifice that washed away all the sins of the world and reconciled mankind to God the Father, made an end of iniquity, brought in everlasting righteousness called the kingdom of heaven, and it exists today. But they want a do-over, don't they? They don't like the way God fulfilled Daniel's 70th week 2,000 years ago. They want a do-over. And I'll tell you what they're going to give you. They're going to give you a false Christ. That's what the whole thing is about. And every pastor behind every pulpit in this church is preaching this nonsense and has been since the, the, the late 1800s. And it's an outrage. And they're not, they're not going to repent of it either. They're going to go to their graves preaching this error. Listen, every one of them needs to have a come-to-Jesus meeting like I did. I'm no different than they are. I believed this nonsense for 50 years of my life. I'm no better than they are. But I finally opened my eyes. Let God speak to my heart about Daniel's prophecy. I'll tell you who caused the, sacri who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. It was Jesus. Three and a half years after his baptism who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease by giving up his own life. And through the Spirit of God, he continued to uh, confirm the covenant in his blood to the Jews for the remaining seven, uh, three and a half years, and then the gospel went to the Gentiles. There's not one portion of Daniel's 70th and final week that is to, to extend into the future. Not one day beyond the rejection of the Jews of the gospel. So the, point, these lies? so the point, Tom, and that was my initial uh, uh, demand that you would explain it, even though I wouldn't take a word away of everything that you said, is to explain to the people how important it is to understand this book that we are reading and discussing, to take off the church's glasses. Yes, Meaning, you have to take off the church's glasses. Absolutely, because, because you are raised in a church that are... Uh, that has on its pulpits pastors and priests that have all been gone through Jesuit seminaries and they all teach something like, even when they teach the King James Bible, they're going to take a Schofield Bible, which yeah. is uh, corrupted by the footnotes. And that's yep. why you should never, ever, ever attend to any footnotes. Just read the plain word of God as it is written in the 1611 yep. King James Bible. And yep. beware of all the false teachers and preachers in your church. And if you want to understand this book well and this whole concept of the truth that the Bible really teaches, you have to take off the church glasses. You cannot go attend a church Listen to what they say, come back, read this book, and say, I understand it all, because you cannot serve two masters. Look, there came a time in my early adult Christian life when it was time for me to buy a Bible. And I was going to a Baptist church at the time, an independent Baptist church. The pastor practically memorized the Bible. He could quote the Bible almost verbatim. He could give you book, chapter, and verse. I never I saw a man who, who so knew the Bible. And he recommended a King James Bible. And he also recommended a Cyrus Schofield reference Bible. So I went out and got a Cyrus Schofield reference Bible. A, 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 a King James, an authorized King James version that was the Cyrus Schofield reference Bible. 
And that's the only Bible I had at the time. And, uh, of course, my pastor, my Baptist pastor, preached out of that Schofield reference Bible. And when we talked about Daniel's prophecy, we're talking about the last and final week of years. The 70th week of Daniel, a seven-year period of time, is lopped off the end of the 69th week and cast 2,000 years or more into the future. And it required... To fulfill it, it required a nation state of Israel. It required a, a rebuilt temple. It required a covenant with the Jews so they could begin animal sacrifices again. And all of a sudden, despite all that I'd been taught, in all the years I went to that Baptist church, it's all a lie. All of it. It was Jesus who fulfilled that 70th and final week of years 2,000 years ago. There was no gap of any duration between the 69th and the 70th week. The 70th week followed the 69th week just like the, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, set, the, the eighth week followed the seven weeks, the seventh week. Okay? Remember, there were seven weeks and 62 weeks. Where's the gap between the seventh week and the 62 weeks? There isn't one. God doesn't play games with the calendar. Okay? The eighth week began just the millisecond that the seventh week ended. And the 70th week began the very millisecond that the 69th week ended. It's a contiguous 490-year period of time. It's simply been divided up into three groups. A seven-year period of time a seven-week-of-year period of time, 49 years, a 62-week period of time, 483 years, all together makes 483 years, uh, and then the last seven-week period of time. What do you get? 490 years. Exactly 70 weeks of years. It's, it's not difficult. It's common sense. The truth makes far more sense than the nonsense they've been teaching in the church for a couple generations. And uh, so so if you don't believe that, the, that Jesus fulfilled that 70th week of Daniel, that the 70th week of Daniel is yet future, then indeed we need a modern nation state of Israel. That took World War I and World War II to accomplish and all the lives that were lost during those wars. And out of that came the League of Nations and the United Nations eventually that authorized this. this you had uh, the, the 1917, you had uh, uh, the Balfour Declaration by a Protestant country, no less, England. And uh, you see the cooperation between England and the Vatican to pull this off, and uh, and the and the World War One and World War Two, which took the cooperation of the, of all the nations of Europe and the United States and Japan, all and the persecution of the Jews. Some say it never happened. I say I don't care whether it happened or not. It made room for six million Jews, if there were any the world Jews to go down to this, this, uh, this, if they were led to believe that they were being persecuted to that degree, that they would flee to this modern nation state of Israel. Look at the efforts that they've, that they've expended to create this modern nation state of Israel. And all of it is so that they can fulfill this phony 70th week of Daniel. They created the modern nation state of Israel, made it look like a miracle from God. Okay. All the kings of the earth cooperated with this nonsense. And now there's been all this talk ever since 1948 about the restoration of, 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 a, of a building of a temple and the priesthood. Why? So that they can build, so that they can make animal sacrifices. Do you think God's going to accept any blood shed from innocent animals up there on that mountain in a rebuilt temple? Why would he send the Roman 10th Legion to, to topple that temple and not, not leave one stone upon the other? Because the Jews who rejected Jesus 2,000 years ago had no salvation unless they could continue to make animal sacrifices for their sins. 
They wanted to prop up that system. Common sense dictates they had to have their temple. They had to have their priesthood. They had to have the holy of holies. Okay? Well, Jesus said, no, you're not going to have it. You're not going to have it at all. There's not going to be anything left of this temple. Okay? I'm putting all you priests in the soup lines. I'm going to put you all in the unemployment line. You ain't going to have nothing to do. No more animal sacrifices because I'm the Lamb of God. I, every lamb, every dove, every pigeon, every bullock that was, slew, that was slain on that mountain was to, was to be a precursor, a spiritual likeness of the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. No blood of lambs and goats can wash away sin. Only the sinless Lamb of God. And when he gave up the ghost, what happened? The veil of the temple was rent from, in twain from top to bottom. Now, who do you think ripped that veil? It was God himself. Rip that veil. No man could do it. God himself ripped the veil of that temple. You will even hear these future pastors admit that it was God who ripped that veil. So why are they teaching that the Jews have to make animal sacrifices again? Why do they criticize the Jews for crucifying their own Messiah and then turn around and say that there has to be a modern nation state of Israel, a modern temple, a modern priesthood, and animal sacrifices and oblations? Why, of course. So the Antichrist can cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. That which Jesus did 2,000 years ago. And I'll tell you something. When this takes place, and they, whoever they elect to be this man of sin, and if he causes the sacrifices and oblations to cease at that point, you won't be able to convince any Christian anywhere that that is the Antichrist, or uh, that, that that is a, a, a phony, okay? And I'm going to tell you what they got planned up their sleeve. You probably, you know, if you listen to me for very long, the only common sense thing that can remain after this so-called Antichrist figure that they've conjured up to, to make these sacrifices and oblations cease, who's going to enter the stage in Jerusalem at that point? A false Christ. And I'm telling you, the Vatican has conjured up this whole thing. It's the Vatican who has always taught two errors, either the preterist error that blames the Antichrist on one of the ancient Roman Caesars or the Roman Catholic papacy that blames the Antichrist on a future individual that's going to make a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews at the end of time, just before Christ's return. So common sense help you understand that the papacy is orchestrating all these lies so that it can sit upon the throne of the earth after he has united all Christians behind this grand delusion called futurism. That's exactly what's happening. And you thank God for revealing to you what this is all about. Now, I don't condemn the modern nation state of Israel. I don't condemn the fact that Jews are living there. I think there ought to be a place in this world for God's Jewish heritage. And I think there ought to be Bible-believing, historicist Christians to witness to them their Messiah, who they wickedly slew 2,000 years ago. God can forgive them. God wants to forgive them. God wants to redeem them, just like he's redeemed all of the Gentile Christians throughout the ages. It's our responsibility. Those of us who, to whom the kingdom of heaven was, was open to after the Jews rejected their Messiah. Now it's our turn to return uh, uh, Christ to the Jews to provoke them to jealousy for their own Messiah. The lamb slain from the foundation of the world was Jesus. They don't need a temple. All they have to do is enter the temple 
that God has made for his whole house, the kingdom of heaven. And uh, leave off this idea of building a temple and making animal sacrifices. To do so is just an outward demonstration that they still reject Jesus as their lamb. Now, any Christian who knows anything about the Bible, who knows anything about history, can listen to what I just said and go, Oh, my God. How have they accomplished such a grand delusion? How have they so complicated the truth? And how is it that every pastor in this country preaches this futurist nonsense and there's nobody that can stand up and refute them and rebut them? That's up to you. God has revealed this truth to you and has given you a mission and a ministry to debunk this futurist nonsense, to lay the blame right on the papacy where it belongs, to warn your Jewish friends about this great, this great apostasy that's taken place among the so-called Christian world, this great futurist lie that has deceived the whole world. Put the papacy back on his heels. We don't need bombs and guns to destroy the Antichrist. All we need is the truth. We're not to kill anyone. We're not to go to war against the Antichrist. All we have to do is tell the truth. That's what they did in the Protestant Reformation. They told the truth. They told the historicist truth that it was the papacy who was the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, the beast, the little horn. It was the papacy. They knew it. They made sure everybody else knew it. They even convinced the kings of Europe that it was the papacy. And that's why the world turned away from the papacy. That was 500, what, 503 years ago. Just 503 years ago, look at what they've done to the truth today. Stay tuned and listen to what this author says in his book. I'm not the only one that believes this. Yerk isn't the only one that believes the historicist truth. The man who wrote this book knows the historicist truth. And what he says in this book makes so much more sense than the gobbledygook they preach and spew from the pulpits of the churches today to make it laughable. Laughable! Scorn! Laugh them to scorn! Back to you, Yerk. Millions of Christians have preceded us, Tom. And millions of Christians also read what you just said, that we don't need a physical sword to defeat the Antichrist. But we need to put on the full armor of God, as it is written in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, where it states, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. And let me interrupt here for a second. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle not against the nation-state of Israel that was planted there by the Antichrist. We wrestle not against the Jewish people that are uh, um, dispersed all over the world and for a very big part now collected into that nation-state of Israel. We do not take a physical sword against them. We wrestle not against them. We wrestle with the Word of God, with the true 1611 King James Bible, for them. We are witnesses to the Jews to tell them that what they easily threw away is what actually belongs to them. And because they threw it away, we pagans got it. Romans 11.11 11. So we wrestle not against flesh and blood, the Bible says, but against principalities, 
against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shut with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of, the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, is what should really stay in your mind after this. Now, continuing in the book. Will he come invisibly? Will the church disappear? Does the Bible really teach vanishing Christians? Without a doubt, the most quoted passage to support the rapture concept is 1 Thessalonians 4.17, as we read already. Lots of Christians know this verse by heart, and it is cited in Left Behind, the movie. There Paul wrote that true believers will someday be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. But does caught up really mean disappear? Is Paul describing a silent return of Jesus Christ before an apocalyptic seven-year tribulation? We don't need to guess. We just need to remind ourselves of what Tom said for the last 25 minutes. And next to that, the answer is in the context, and you don't need to have a four-year degree to grasp the truth. Here is what Paul actually wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 through 17. I'm going to read from the King James Bible. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Rapture teachers interpret this event as silent and secret. Yet, doesn't it seem rather loud and visible? There's a shout, there's a voice, there's a trumpet. Have you ever heard of a silent trumpet? The truth is, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 is one of the noisiest verses in the whole Bible. But look carefully, Jesus Christ comes down from heaven shouting and blowing a trumpet. The dead rise, then true believers are caught up. Honestly, do you see anything here about vanishing Christians prior to the tribulation? Rapture promoters interpret caught up to mean disappear, because this view fits their tightly meshed prophetic system. Yet, it must be admitted that the text, the biblical text, doesn't say this. 2,000 years ago, at the end of his early life, Jesus Christ was also taken up, as we read in Acts chapter 1, verse 9. This doesn't mean he disappeared, leaving his clothes on earth. No, instead, in full view of his wandering disciples, quote, while they watched, he was taken up, and the cloud received them out of their sight. Acts chapter 1, verse 9. This event was highly visible. The Apostle Luke said Jesus Christ was taken up and then clouds are mentioned, just like Paul wrote about believers being caught up in the clouds. Now notice carefully the full text of Acts chapter 1 verse 9 through 11 that is again taken from the King James Bible in this reading. And when he, speaking of Jesus Christ, 
had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and the cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye, men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Here we have holy angels in the form of men in white robes explaining the simple truth about Jesus Christ's return. They told the disciples that just as Jesus was literally and visibly taken up into the clouds, even so would he come in like manner as they had seen him go into heaven. Although these angels never attended the seminary, there is no doubt they had their theology straight. They taught no secret coming of vanishing Christians. Everything will be highly visible, just like the ascension of Jesus Christ. Now let's turn to 1 Thessalonians and take a look at the thief in the night idea in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and in chapter 5 up to verse 3. We read in the King James Bible. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have, no, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Here Paul compares the coming of Jesus Christ to the arrival of a midnight thief. Rapture promoters interpret this to mean Jesus will come like a silent thief to snatch believers off this earth before the seven years of chaos. Then driverless cars will crash, pilotless planes will collide, and babies will be found missing from their cribs. The Christian film A Thief in the Night, which is similar to Left Behind the Movie, portrays this dramatically. Yet, is this really what Paul is saying? Again, let's slow down and take a closer look, not with the church glasses on, at our biblical speedometers. First of all, the day when Jesus comes as a thief is clearly the very same day in which he descends with a shout and a trumpet blast. Secondly, it comes as a thief in the night only upon the unprepared. When it hits, sudden destruction comes upon them, the lost, as labor pains upon the pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Now do you see what Paul is really saying here? Jesus coming as a thief in the night does not mean he will come quietly and invisible to steal believers out of this world, as is taught in rapture movies and the New York Times best-selling books. Rather, it means he will come unexpectedly, bringing sudden destruction upon the unsaved. Thus, it is not a secret coming, but only a sudden one. Will the unprepared get a second chance to be saved during a subsequent seven-year tribulation? Now, Paul answered this question when he wrote, They shall not escape, in verse 3 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Here's a simple summary of what 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 until chapter 5, verse 3 really says. Jesus Christ will literally descend from heaven with a shout and a trumpet blast. The dead in Christ will rise first and true believers will be caught up, just like Jesus Christ himself was visibly taken up into the sky almost 2,000 years ago. This cataclysmic day of the Lord will burst upon the unprepared 
like the unexpected arrival of a midnight thief. Southern destruction will overwhelm the lost, and they shall not escape. When taken literally, these words describe the visible second coming of Jesus Christ. They do not describe a secret rapture. Immediately after his solemn prediction of Christ's return as a midnight thief, Paul wrote to true believers in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the continuing after, after verse 3 in verses 4 through 5, quote, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Now, Remember the blackout of 2003? It left 50 million North Americans in darkness because a massive system failure short-circuited our electrical power grid. At least when it comes to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16 until chapter 5 verse 3, we have just witnessed another system failure. The popular doctrine of a silent, secret return of Jesus Christ and vanishing Christians is just not there. Again, Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 5, Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. God wants us to avoid truth outages. He wants the lights on. And he provides the light, with this, which is the light of life, and that is Jesus Christ. Next time, we will go into the reading of this book in chapter 2, The Perugia and Twinkling Eyes, and I'm very much looking forward to meeting Brother Tom Fress again for another reading and analysis of this wonderful book of Steve Wahlberg, the um, uh, end time delusions and everything that it inhales. It was a very interesting and I hope also quote unquote enlightening, giving you biblical knowledge reading of today. I want to thank Tom very much for his efforts that even through his laryngitis he came to the mic and he so vividly explained to us that we have to church to take off our church glasses and he explained to us the great falling away and that he who now let it must be taken out of the way how important that word now is that little three word word now in 2 Thessalonians 2 as much of as an importance as in Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 the word he is a two letter word in Daniel and a three letter word in Thessalonians change the meaning and the understanding of the whole Bible if you do not pay attention. So thank you for paying attention today to our reading and I'm going to leave it to Tom to get us to the final remarks of today's reading. Please, Tom. Yes, thanks, Jörg. And uh, I just want to part with the listeners with this. The point is well made that before you read Daniel's prophecy again in chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, Take off the church's glasses. Otherwise, you're going to read it and interpret it just like you've been taught in all the churches. And what they're going to tell you is that there's a man of sin, a he. A man of sin is going to cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. In a future 70th week of Daniel, that's 2,000 years beyond when it really occurred. And if you read that prophecy before you take off the church's glasses, you're going to read it and interpret it just exactly the way the church has read it and interpreted it to you for all your Christian life. Just read Daniel's prophecy the way it's written, okay? The Bible's not hard to read. The authorized King James Version of the Bible is the equivalent of an eighth grade rendering. Anybody can read the authorized King James Version of the Bible and get what is written. And uh, you'll see for yourself. 
that it was Jesus who fulfilled that prophecy 2,000 years ago, perfectly and completely. There's no future seven-year period of time. It was 2,000 years ago. And because the Jews rejected the covenant in his blood, that covenant was introduced to the Gentile world. God had blinded the Jews so that we could partake of that covenant. We have partaken of that covenant. We don't need a seven-year period of time. We've had the whole Christian era to provoke the Jews to jealousy for their own Messiah, the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world who came right on time at the end of the 69th week was anointed by John in the River Jordan at the beginning of the 70th week who made a covenant with the Jews and Israel for seven years. In the midst of that seven-year period of time, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease by confirming that covenant, by spilling his blood, becoming the Lamb of God, fulfilling the prophecy. And for the last three and a half years of that 70th and final week, his spirit-filled apostles continued to offer the covenant of salvation in his blood for three and a half more years. Go not into the, unto the way of the Gentiles. Okay? They did not preach the covenant of the blood of Jesus to the Gentiles until the end of the 70th and final week. That 490 calendar year prophecy came to a specific end and the Jews rejected the gospel of Jesus, rejected the covenant, and because of that, the gospel came to the Gentiles, and you and I have benefited from the sacrifice that Christ made. We've been made members of the kingdom of Christ, a heavenly kingdom, a kingdom not of this world, and the kingdoms of this world are now united together with the papacy, the man of sin, the son of perdition, to perpetuate on this world one of the greatest deceptions since the Garden of Eden. It's called futurism. And it's to deny that Jesus fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel, that some, some Antichrist is going to fulfill it that at the end of time, and then the Pope can rule and reign this world, just as he's always hoped and dreamed. The very man of sin, the very son of perdition, Stay tuned for next time when we continue this reading. But when you read God's word, take off the church's glasses. Put your own glasses on. Pray the Holy Spirit to read along with you and remind you of the things that Jesus and the apostles said. Forget what the pastors of the churches tell you. They have an agenda and that is to drag the whole Christian world into this delusion that they've worked 150 years to perpetuate. The truth makes far more sense. You'll see it with your own eyes. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. By recognizing Jerusalem and moving our embassy there, uh, our country is saying what we know from history and the Bible, that Jerusalem has actually been the capital of Jerusalem for 3,000, or capital Israel. of Israel for 3,000 years. And here's why that is so significant. That historical truth that Jerusalem has been the capital for 3,000 years absolutely explodes the myth that comes from the left that somehow the Jewish people just came into that land 70 years ago and they took it away from the Palestinians and that the Jews have no rightful claim to it. The Bible says and history confirms that God gave that land to the Jewish people and I believe as G Genesis 12 says God blesses those countries that bless Israel and he curses those countries countries that curse Israel. I believe President Trump and the United States are not only on the right side of history in this decision, they're on the right side of God. And here it is, the Balfour Declaration. What do you feel when you, when you see it here? 
I genuinely feel it's one of the most extraordinary moments in the history of the Jewish people. If you think it took 3,000 years uh, to get to this. And then you say, how did this miracle happen? It's the most incredible piece of opportunism. I mean, if you think you had an impoverished uh, would-be scientist, Heim Weizmann, who somehow gets to England, meets a few people, including members of my family, seduces them, he has such great charm and conviction. He gets to Balfour, and he unbelievably persuades Balfour and Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, and most of the ministers, that this idea of um, the national home for um, Jews should be allowed to take place. I mean, it's so, so unlikely. You come back to the big point, which is that this is perhaps the greatest event in Jewish life for thousands of years. And it's a miracle that it took place.